So I wanted to talk a bit more about uh, irrotational and incompressible vector fields. So remember that uh, a vector field is incompressible if its divergence vanishes and irrotational if its curl vanishes. So the first thing is we have a theorem that relates these and that is that if f is conservative then f is irrotational and <clears throat> uh, this and then uh, it almost goes the other way so if f is irrotational and the domain of f is simply connected so remember that means it has no holes then f is conservative and in fact this is just new language for a theorem that we've already seen this is uh, just the part of the path independence theorem that relates conservative with exact because irrotational is the same thing as exact. It's just now understanding it in the context of um, uh, curl. So the, comp the computation for why it works is that if we look at the curl of the gradient of something, so if capital F is conservative, then it looks like a gradient, right? Um, then we're looking at the curl of, well, a gradient looks like first partial derivative, comma, second partial derivative. And so for the curl, what we do is we take um, ddx of the second coordinate and we subtract ddy of the first coordinate. And then you can see that these are mixed partials. So this is uh, zero by Clairaut's theorem. Okay, um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was just to go back to that example of the magic vector field. So if we look at minus y over x squared plus y squared, x over x squared plus y squared, earlier uh, I mentioned that it's kind of difficult to see in, in, from scratch why this cannot be um, conservative. So why isn't it the gradient of something? And I thought it would be good to actually look at that uh, with, in, a, in a little more detail. Because this is our example of something which has uh, curl equal to zero, um, but which is not con uh, conservative, right? So imagine what it would look like if this actually were, um, oh, come on. There we go. if this actually were uh, conservative. So that the flow lines go like this, right? Now, if this were a gradient, then that means these are the directions that you would have to go uh, in order to increase the value of the function. So in other words, if we were to follow like the flow line of the a flow line of this vector field looks like uh, a circle. And so if, um, if we were to follow such a path, then what would happen? Well, all the point, like the points along here, that whoops, the, um, if this were the gradient of some function, little f, then the values of the function here, this might be like where f is equal to some, some uh, function a. And then as we go further, like over here, then this might be the line, this, the, the level curve where f is equal to b. And then, you know, for something more, F equals C. So we've got, you know, A is smaller than B is smaller than C because this is the direction that the gradient is telling us to go. The gradient says this is the way you go to increase the value of the function, right? So now what happens by the time we get over here to something like where F takes the value D? Eh, well, now we've got some value that's strictly bigger than A where we started. And we're going to get into trouble when we reach this part right here, right? <clears throat> if we started at zero on one side and then we go around and we get to something that's strictly positive on the other side, there's 
a problem, a big fat hairy problem. In fact, the problem looks like this. Uh, where's my this? That's what it looks like. So the reason why we have an issue is because the function that it wants to be a gradient of, because if I were to is is this one here, this this sort of helicoid, and you can see that the um, the value after we go around. It's going to be much higher than the value where we started. So there's no way to have this be a continuous vector field. That's the, the crux of the problem.